I hope this is intelligible. This is from Alice Through the Looking Glass, which is a book that every British child is brought up on. Um, it's, a, it's a conversation between the walrus and the carpenter. And this is just a small part of it. The time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax and cabbages and kings. Um, that's my theme for today, which is about everything. Okay. Um, last year, I was invited to speak at a conference on prospects for a new realism. Honestly, I didn't know whether I should laugh or I should cry because I have been working on this topic for decades. And when I arrive in Bonn, um, the professor who wants a new realism, um, whom his colleagues tell me is 35 years old, looks roughly 12 to me. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, um, what is he going to think? But never mind, I did my thing and it was OK. Um, why didn't I know whether to laugh or cry? Um, I started thinking about these issues in the late 1970s. Um, the innocent realism that I'll develop here, I was starting to work out in the early 1990s. And it called on ideas from Peirce, who in turn called on ideas from Duns Scotus. So I, I had to admit to the people in Bonn, um, with any luck, what I say here will be true but I can't possibly claim that all of it is new. Um, I, I thought the best way to present this, because it's a ridiculously ambitious paper, was to tell you how I got to the point I'm at now. Um, in the early days, I was thinking about how Quine and Strawson had, on each side of the Atlantic, initiated a kind of revival of metaphysics after the positivist onslaught, um, wondering whether they weren't being too modest about what the object of metaphysics was because they were still suffering from fear of positivism. I was puzzling over Carnap's distinction between internal and external questions, um, where Quine was no help at all. Quine, I think, completely misunderstood this thought it was the same as the analytic synthetic distinction. And everybody thought that that was all taken care of, but I, I think that was false. And I spent a lot of time working on that very strange paper of Quine's and Goodman's called Steps Towards a Constructive Nominalism, which opens with the sentence, we don't believe in abstract objects, and closes with an acknowledgment that, hmm, Actually, we, if, if we don't believe in abstract objects, we're not quite clear how to explain in logical terms. There are more cats than dogs, which seems like a kind of elementary thing not to be able to explain. Um, two key ideas began to fall into place, I now realize, in the 70s. Um, first of all, metaphysics, when it's done right, is about the world. It's not about our language, and it's not about our concepts. And I still believe to this day that the question of nominalism and realism remains crucial. I know I was attracted to it in part because of Chauncey Wright's observation about it. This is the question on which each new-fledged masculine intellect likes to try its powers of dissertation. How could I resist? It's such an insult to my sex to suggest that I couldn't possibly do this. So. Um, a bit later, things changed in England, and I was thinking about realism versus relativism and realism versus anti-realism. Um, the 80s were a bad decade for this. You couldn't go deliver a lecture anywhere in England without someone would say, are you a realist or are you an anti-realist? Which meant, are you with Davidson or are you with Dummett? Um, it took me years to figure out the correct answer to this question, which was no. Okay. Um, gradually, I came to see realism doesn't refer to a single thesis. It refers to a whole family. And probably because the person who had the office next door to me was 
the last living hardline Popperian in the English-speaking world, um, I began to be quite interested in Popper's defense of realism and his three worlds metaphysics, which in the end I decided were very badly flawed. Um, I think for a long time I was kind of afraid of distinguishing senses of existence because Quine was so, so strong along, you know, do not multiply senses of existence beyond necessity. And it took me a long while to realize it was necessary. And I saw, eventually, the usefulness of the distinction Peirce makes between reality, which is the mode of being of, he calls them generals, the usual term would be universals, and existence of particulars. Uh, I began to see how plausible his thesis was that nominalism undermines the scientific enterprise. I now think that's exactly right. And that in turn suggested that Quine's criterion of ontological commitment created a false dichotomy. To be is to be the value of a variable. That means to be the value of a bound variable in some theory represented in first order predicate calculus. Um, that, I think, created a false dichotomy which allowed only two possibilities, neither of which I, was, I found acceptable. Nominalism, which allowed only the, the concrete particulars, or a kind of pseudo-realism in which rather than real universals, real generals, what you got was abstract particulars as ersatzen for real generals. Um, I think this point fell into place. I think I can remember exactly when. Um, the first time I read uh, the paper in which Peirce declares for realism in 1871, in which he describes Berkeley's philosophy as nominalistic Platonism. And I ran away from that back to Quine and said, ah, yes, the options he's giving us are real nominalism and nominalistic Platonism. But I don't want either of those, thank you. All right, then I began developing innocent realism. There was the first brief statement in a paper called Reflections on Relativism, then a much more refined version in Realisms and Their Rivals, applied to the philosophy of science in 2003. And since then, I've been working on how it might apply to philosophy of law. Okay, here are the ideas that began. That was just history. If you don't, if you don't care about my history, you can forget all that. This is how I got where I am today. Um, first thought, realism needs disambiguation. Um, what different forms share is the idea that something is independent of something about us. What they disagree about is what it is that's independent of what about us. Um, so we could disambiguate by means of that very useful expression as opposed to. I think you can learn a lot about the meaning of philosophical terms by asking yourself, what's it intended to preclude? Um, I sometimes thought there should be a logical operator that means as opposed to. So there's perceptual realism as opposed to the representative theory of perception or the idea theory, if you prefer that phrase. There's physicalism, dualism, pluralism, neutral monism as opposed to subjective idealism. Um, I'm inclined to say that objective idealism is exactly on the border between realism and, and something else. And then this is the Davidson versus Dummett aspect of it. The thesis that there can be unknowable truths as opposed to the idea that the true is the justifiably assertable. Uh, and then there's realism about universals or generals as opposed to nominalism or conceptualism. And there are many, many versions of scientific realism. For example, as opposed to instrumentalism, as opposed to constructive empiricism, as opposed to certain forms of social constructivism. We'll get there later. Then there's metaphysical realism. This is not a typographical error. It has capital letters because this is supposed to refer to Putnam's metaphysical realist, and he always has capital letters. So, okay. 
as opposed to, for example, conceptual relativity or other forms of metaphysical relativism. Ah, unfortunately, to make life even more complicated, relativism is again not a simple idea. It's a family of ideas. Something is relative in some sense to something else. Um, I wonder if any of you have ever had this experience. Have you ever had the experience you're, you're, you're talking with a student, you know, comes in your office and says, I remember exactly what this student said, Dr. Hark, what is relativism? I know Dr. X, that's a colleague, is against it, but I don't know what it is. Right, so I, first of all, I drew my conclusions about Dr. X. <laughs> Namely, he could be clearer. Um, and then I began drawing on the blackboard. Well, look, it's the thesis that something is relative to something. Right? And then I began writing columns of what? You know, um, truth to language, say. Or meaning to theory, or et cetera, et cetera. And by the end of 10 minutes, I had a really nice diagram on my blackboard. And unfortunately, this was before the days of cell phones that would take a photograph. I had to go, I had painfully to write it all down on a piece of paper and go write it up. Okay. Um, these were some of my entries in my columns. It's not that every, every combination gives you a, realist, a, a, a feasible form of relativism, but a lot of them do. Um, it might be meaning or reference or truth or metaphysical commitment or ontology or reality or epistemic values or moral values or aesthetic values said to be relative to language, conceptual scheme, theory, paradigm, version, depiction, description. That's the, the Goodman triple of phrases. Culture, community, individual. Um, on paper, these had dots at the bottom for I could continue, but I couldn't figure out how to do it on the computer, so you don't have them. Um, not all forms are, no, nobody really thinks moral values are relative to scientific paradigms, say. I don't think so, anyway. But you can identify specific people's relativist views by means of this diagram. So Rorty's claim that truth is what can overcome conversational objections would be 3G. Quine's thesis of ontological relativity would be 2C. Worf's thesis of linguistic relativity would be 4C. Putnam's conceptual relativity, which is kind of obscure, but I think it's either 5A or 5B. Goodman's strange pluralism is 6E. And epistemological relativisms, well, Annis is clearly 7G, and Kuhn is clearly 7D. Um, more recent relativists like De Rose would actually require me to add something because they're talking about knowledge and not epistemic justification. Okay. Um, why was I doing this? Well, first of all, because it was interesting to see, oh, I've got a map, and I can locate people on it, like sort of sticking pins in. But it began to be clear that there were some forms of relativism that might be true, and others that were false or even self-defeating, and that it was a terribly bad idea to go around like my colleague Dr. X, just complaining about relativism that it was self-defeating, because not all forms are. I mean, if Tarski's thesis say that the truth of sentences is relative to a language, seems to me to be undeniably true and not in any way self-defeating. It also, this, I was also able to begin to get some grip on which forms of realism offer real insights from those that overstate or overreach Especially, I was concerned about those that tack on epistemological ideas to metaphysical ones, which I think is overreach for a metaphysical theory. Okay, and this is what led me to develop the new theory I call innocent realism. I just Google imaged innocent realism, not knowing what would come up. And this came up. I think it's perfect. Right? I'm just looking at the world and going, gee, it's, really, it's like that. Okay. All right. Here's the core. 
Um, first of all, I have no doubt at all that metaphysics is a legitimate enterprise. I suffer no fear of positivism, I guess. Um, it's true, however, metaphysics has often found itself caught up in questions that really are unanswerable. I think the explanation to that, the explanation of this is metaphysics is hard. And if you make a misstep, if you make a false assumption, then you will inevitably face a lot more questions based on that false assumption. And when you give answers to those questions, you will have bad answers to a bad question because the false assumption is infecting the whole shoot. And it's clear what the solution is. You have to go back until you find the false assumptions and start again from there. Um, I think perhaps one, one of the most vivid illustrations is I believe that a lot of the questions that modal metaphysicians ask about possible worlds derive from false assumptions about possible worlds and especially about accessibility in the first place. But once you start answering, asking those questions, then the only way to get out of a big mess is to go back, start again. Um, moreover, as I saw very early on, I think metaphysics ought to be about the world. Um, that means it depends on experience. It's not a purely a priori enterprise. Um, that doesn't mean it depends on experiments or expeditions or exhumations of archaeological... No. It doesn't depend on recondite observations. It requires, on, it requires stuff we all know about the world but we don't pay close attention to. Um, I'm afraid the missing quotation marks are a typographical error. I'm sorry. Um, the world of innocent realism, then, is... This is my short story. One real world, which is largely but not wholly independent of us, our actions, our beliefs, and so on, which is manifestly extremely heterogeneous, but also, I believe, in the sense I try to explain, unified. Okay. It includes, I would say, Particulars and generals, particular things, events, phenomena, and general kinds, laws, properties, etc. Natural objects, stuff, phenomena, kinds, and laws. On top of which, in our corner of the world, there is built a vast array of artifacts from birds' nests, beavers' dams, to human beings, houses, huts, cars, railways, airplanes, airports, books, computers, oh, cabbage, no song, shoes and ships and sealing wax, not cabbages, but kings. Okay. It also includes mental states and processes. Our thoughts and our dreams are real. We really do have thoughts and dreams. Um, I hope there are no Freudians in the audience because you, you may learn something about me with the next story. But when I was a small child, I had a recurring dream. I was being chased up and down the stairs of my uncle's house by a horse. This is a crazy dream. There was no way you could get a horse in the front door of my uncle's house, but that was the dream. I did not dream that I was being chased around the kitchen of my grandmother's house by an oversized chicken. So there's something real about this dream, even though, of course, I was never chased up and down the stairs by a horse. Ah, then there are social institutions. They're real. Um, Anyone who's ever been in trouble with the law knows that the law is a real social institution. Um, there are social institutions, roles, rules, norms. There are human languages and other systems of signs, like musical notations and so forth. 
dance notations even. There are scientific, mathematical, philosophical, etc., etc., etc. theories. There are works of history and art criticism. There are myths, legends, and works of fiction. And there are fictional characters and fictional places. Fiction is a real phenomenon. There really are works of fiction. I couldn't possibly travel across the Atlantic if there weren't. I would die of boredom if there weren't novels to read. Okay. Um, even this, and I've given you a long, long list of very, very different kinds of things, but this is still too much like this view from New York. You used to be able to buy a postcard of this view from New York. Um, if you're familiar with the geography, you will see Manhattan is most of the world. Right? <laughs> then there are the boroughs beyond Manhattan. And then there's a tiny sliver, which is California. And then there's the Pacific Ocean. Well, what I've told you so far is too much like that. Um, first of all, we humans and the Earth are just a tiny part of a larger universe. And that larger universe, if recent cosmological speculation turns out to be true, I have no idea whether it will, may itself be only one universe among many multiverses. Okay. Um, that was the best picture I could find of multiverses. It's not, of course, a photograph. It's, it's an imagined thing. So, using a technique that I find quite useful in in philosophy, I think of it as the method of successive approximation. Begin with something that you, you're pretty confident is true, like there is one real world. And then make it more precise without making it false. Actually, this is hard, because it's a lot easier to say something true if what you say is vague. It's more difficult to say something true the more precise it is. So this raises two hard questions immediately. What does one mean and what does real mean? Okay. What does one mean? Well, this is just the beginnings of an answer. There isn't more than one. There isn't, for example, a physical world and a spiritual world. And Popper's talk of three worlds or modal logician's talk of many possible worlds I think is unhelpful if it's taken literally. It may have some merit taken you know, in a somewhat figurative sense, but literally it doesn't help anything. It just gives you horrible problems about the relation among the worlds. Okay. At the same time, the world is unified. What does that mean? Um, you probably think she must be a reductionist then, right? It's all going to be reduced to physics. No. I don't think so. Um, I do think the artifacts that we make are constrained by physical properties of stuff. Um, for example, um, imagine trying to make a working typewriter out of butter. Can't be done. It's the wrong kind of stuff. Um, I used to use the example, imagine trying to make a pillow out of rock. Um, seemed nearly impossible, but then I was in Oslo and they took me to look at the exhibit of the Kontiki expedition. And guess what? In the South Pacific, they were actually using headrests, pillows, made out of stone. So I had to drop that example. Um, and I believe that our beliefs and hopes and fears and so on are realized in physiological states of our nervous systems. Um, not, however, that they're reducible to those states. This was the theme of my paper yesterday, so some of you have more idea what I'm thinking than others. So what does real mean? Well, it can't mean independent of us. That would imply that tables and chairs and bottles and computers and books and the room we're in and that stove in the corner that I will never forget that would mean they're not real. Well, obviously they're real. Of course they're real. Okay. Nor can it mean mind independent, which is a popular idea of what real means. Because that would imply that dreams and thoughts and so on are not real. 
which they are, according to me. No, I think the contrast is with fictional, imaginary, a figment. That's what real contrasts with. Um, imaginary beasts and fictional characters are as their creators make them. They have the properties their creators give them. That's what distinguishes them from real things. <coughs> so real, if I'm right that it means not fictional, not imaginary, means independent of what you or I or anyone thinks about it. This is the idea that I borrowed from Peirce, and it's an idea that he borrowed from Dun Scotus. Um, I can't speak to the accuracy of Peirce's Scotus scholarship, but that's where he says he found it. Um, now you might be very puzzled. Didn't I say the one real world includes works of fiction and fictional characters? Yeah, it does. But those fictional characters are not real people, or real rabbits, or real hobbits, or whatever it is that the fiction is about. There really are fictional characters, but fictional characters are not real. Okay. Um, okay. You may say, ah, she's gone crazy. This is, this is Minong, isn't it? This is terrible. Um, no. Uh, well, maybe it is Minongian, but if it is Minongian, Russell was very unfair to him. I have long suspected that Russell was unfair. I don't know how unfair. Maybe it is Minongian, but what it means is that Middlemarch is a real work of fiction, and Dorothea Brooke is a real fictional character, but there never was any such place as Middlemarch, nor any such person as Dorothea Brooks. And there is nothing paradoxical about that. However, it is forcing me to a surprising conclusion. And that is just as when you compare a real X with a fake X, right? You know, a real Rolex with a fake Rolex, for example. There has to be a sort of term that follows real. So there has to be, when you're talking metaphysics, real as opposed to imaginary. Because there are real imagined people, but they are not real people. I am no Minong scholar. I am not going to say whether that may have been what he was thinking, but maybe it was. Um, however, now there's a problem. Um, interestingly enough, I got as far as the first half of this slide in Bonn. Didn't, didn't do the one step of modus ponens that led to the shocking conclusion. And nobody in the audience noticed. I only realized I had a problem on the, on the plane home. I was lucky. <laughs> um, I think fiction comes in degrees, or better. Um, I think fiction can be partial. What do I mean? Um, you probably have a corresponding Polish expression. The English expression we have is fish stories. These are stories told by fishermen. Right, they come back from their fishing expedition and they say, oh, I caught a trout, it was this big. And the next time they tell the story, it was this big. And the next time they tell the story, it was this big. And so it gets bigger and bigger. Okay. Why, why is that relevant? Well, I think that fiction arises out of our natural inclination to describe real events. We narrate things that happen. And when we narrate things that happen, we also have a natural tendency to embroider them, right, to make them more complicated, more detailed, usually more flattering to us, right, as the fish that gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But look, if real contrasts with fiction, and fiction can be partial or comes in degrees, then reality comes in degrees. Now, this, this really sounds scary. Right. I had a very bad week when I drew this conclusion, when I thought, that I just have to throw this paper away. I must have done something wrong. This is terrible. And now I think, no, that's right. It's actually true. Reality can be 
Oh, sure. What do I mean? Um, actually, this illustrates two points. It illustrates the point about degree partial fictionality and partial reality. Um, it also illustrates what I mean when I say metaphysics is about the world and therefore requires thought about what you know about the world. Okay. Um, King Arthur. I don't, I don't know if this legend... Is this legend familiar to you? Okay, good. Um, as it happens, when I was 16 years old, I had to take in school a course on Roman Britain for no good reason except that the school had bought the books several years before and they couldn't afford any more. So it was quite dull, much of this. But one part of the story remained with me ever since. The Romans left Britain in order to defend Rome. They pulled the troops out of the far parts of the empire to defend Rome against the barbarians who were trying to attack it. They left Britain not only with no defenses against the Saxons who were eyeing the island and thinking, look, it's rich, we'd like, to, we'd like to invade it, we could take it over now, the Romans have left. It was also tribal. There was no central government now the Romans had left. But there was one chieftain who managed to pull the tribes together and say, look, I know that we fight each other all the time, but we have to do something about these Saxons or we're all in trouble. So we have to join together and fight and fight them off. This is the origin of the King Arthur legend. This was, in some sense, King Arthur. But all the stuff about the round table, the hundred knights, the sword in the stone, Camelot, all that. It's pure fiction, and it's embroidery on this old story. You can identify where it comes from, Geoffrey of Monmouth in the 13th century. So I would say King Arthur has one foot in reality and one foot in fiction. He's exactly half real, okay. exactly half imaginary. Um, innocent realism is metaphysical and it's realist, but it isn't what Putnam calls metaphysical realism. Um, first of all, I've been talking for, what, 20 minutes? I don't know. Um, I have never mentioned anything like a fixed totality of mind-independent objects. In fact, the only thing I've said about mind-independent is that that isn't what real means. Nor have I said anything about a privileged vocabulary in which there could be one true description of the world, also a characteristic thesis of metaphysical realism as Putnam understands it. Rather, I, I deny that real means mind independent, and I believe that there are many, many different true descriptions of the world in different vocabularies which are not always mutually intertranslatable. Um, now I'm remembering a very nice talk I heard by Michele Tarufo, who is a law professor from Pavia, who was talking about what a legal fact was. And he had some book with him, I don't know what it was, just some book which he held up and said, look, think how many descriptions there are of this book. They're endless when you think about it. You, know, you start by talking about, well, you know, it's blue and it's six inches by nine and it's about yay thick. And then you realize that there's everything to be said about its content and the consequences of its content and about the material of which it's made and the physical construction of that material. And you could go on forever. Many true descriptions of the world. All right. How does this apply in the natural sciences? Well, this is how I apply it. I think scientific theories are normally either true or else false. There are special cases which are neither, but they're special. And I think the goal of scientific inquiry is to find answers to the questions at issue, and that means, by my lights, true answers. If I want an answer, I want the true answer. I don't just want any old answer, true or false. That means that I repudiate both instrumentalism and constructive empiricism. There is 
a complicated argument why that's so in defending science. I won't rehearse it here. Um, but at bottom, the thought is that there is not really a sharp distinction between either between observation and theory or between observational terms and theoretical terms. And both of these views, I believe, require such a distinction to be made. Um, this doesn't mean that scientists seek the truth in big letters as if it was something religious that they were after. No, what it means is that if they're inquiring into whether P, they want to end up believing that P if P, and believing that not P if not P, and there wasn't room on the slide, but to end up believing it's a lot more complicated than P or not P if it is more complicated. So for example, um, Watson and Crick wanted the answer to the question, what is the structure of DNA? Right. And what that means, according to me, is they wanted to fetch up with the conclusion DNA is a double helical backbone out macromolecule with like with unlike base pairs. If DNA is a double helical backbone out like, like with like base pairs macromolecule and to end up believing it's a triple helix with the backbone inside and like with like base pairs if that's what it is. Okay. Um, and to say that scientists seek the truth is not to say they always succeed. On the contrary, I think progress in the sciences is very ragged, very uneven, very unpredictable. Okay. Um, of course, that's not truth isn't enough for success. You want explanatory truths. Imagine if Watson and Crick had worked for years and then said, ah, we found the answer, and we're sure it's true. Either DNA is a double helical molecule or not. Well, yeah, it's true, but it's completely non-explanatory. And I believe explanation requires generality. Right? So you require explanatory truth for success in science. Explanation requires generality. That's to say it requires real kinds and real laws. If there were no real kinds and no real laws, Scientific explanation, I believe, would be impossible. There could be no such thing. We could describe the world. We could describe particulars, but we couldn't explain how things work. Um, what does that mean? It's not Platonism. It doesn't mean over and above particular cats there is a kind, cat. It means something like <coughs> cats are alike regardless of what we believe about them which is not to say all cats are alike in every respect. Um, my neighborhood is full of cats. Um, you know, um, fat ones, thin ones, big ones, small ones, bold ones, timid ones, friendly ones, hostile ones, different sizes, colors, temperaments. Actually, it's like a Darwinian um, experiment. Right, you, you, can, you can watch the genetic lottery playing out in the neighborhood as kittens show up and you can guess who their parents were. Right? But they all have certain things in common. They're all carnivorous. They all run the same way. They all stalk the same way. You know, they see a bird they might get and they're on three feet with one about to move, frozen. They all sit the same in the same patterns, they all wash the same way, they all run up the trees and then when they have to come back down, uh oh, it's much harder. Scrabble, scrabble, scrabble. Don't look, I'm embarrassed, you, you know? Okay, that's what I mean by there are real kinds and cats is one of them. Okay. And of course, just as there's no guarantee of the truth of scientific, of scientific theories, there's no guarantee that the terminology in the relevant science picks out real kinds. Um, a good vocabulary is a real scientific achievement. It took roughly 100 years <coughs> to get the term DNA to apply to just this stuff. So the history of scientific terminology is of great 
interest to me because it shows scientists working to develop a vocabulary that identifies real kinds. And that's an achievement because it involves a relation to the world. Okay. Um, no, I don't think kind terms are rigid designators. I think they have meanings, and I think the meanings grow as our knowledge grows. And moreover, I think people who ask, you know, is there really, is there really furniture, or are there only molecules and atoms? I think that's just a, 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 a misguided question. Chairs and books and trees and whatnot consist of atoms, just like a suite of furniture consists of chairs and a sofa. What about the social sciences? Well, there aren't only natural kinds, cats, dogs, trees, etc. There are artifactual kinds, like chair and lamp. And there are social kinds, like money, marriage, law, um, some of which I think are universal, <coughs> and some of which you only find in some societies. So only some societies have banks, for example. Only some societies have newspapers. Only some societies have street names and numbers. Um, the last example I put in when I read in the newspaper, see, it's experience of the world coming in again. I read in the newspaper while I was writing this. This is just amazing. Who knew? In Costa Rica, there are no street names and numbers. If you want to write to somebody in Costa Rica a letter, you will say, you know, Senor uh, Gonzalez, um, third house from the Pizza Hut. Right? <laughs> because there are no street names and numbers. Okay. Uh, the challenge posed by social institutions, for me, that is, is that they really do depend in part on what people in the society believe about them. So that they, they put some pressure on my definition of real. Um, for example, whether a currency is viable depends on whether people believe it is. And if everybody loses faith in the currency, then the wheelbarrow in which you take home you know, the millions and millions of, of, of worthless Deutschmarks in which you've been paid for the week, the wheelbarrow is worth more than the money is. Right? Um, I noticed in Zimbabwe recently, they were making compost out of million-dollar bills because they were, they're simply worthless. Their, their currency is just fatally lost, lost confidence in altogether. Okay. Um, <coughs> nevertheless, these social institutions are real, um, I might be able to change my social class in the course of my life by the work that I do, for example, or my education. Or I suppose by marrying an earl, though it's a little late for that. Um, but I can't change the social class into which I was born. That's a fact. That's something real and unchangeable by my beliefs. And if, if uh, Jan and I start printing dollar bills in the basement of this building, it doesn't matter if we believe that they're real. They just aren't. Right? There are none with Obama's face on. That's the point of the illustration. Um, so we need a second addendum. The first was it, comes, it can be partial. Reality can be partial. The second is there's a distinction between the brutally real which is independent of what anyone or everyone believes about it. You know, rocks just don't depend on what we believe about them. Mountains don't. Rivers don't. And then there's the real but socially constructed, which is independent of what you or I or any individual person believes about it, but may depend on what some group of people believe about it. Okay, so the concept of reality turns out to be richer, deeper, and more complex than I initially imagined. Um, what about our beliefs? Uh, this was the question that I got really pressed with in Bonn. What about our beliefs? Don't they depend on what we believe? Well, yes, but they don't depend on what we believe about them. What my beliefs are doesn't depend on what I believe my beliefs are. I can be mistaken about them. Yes? Um, we and our beliefs, I would say, are part of the natural world. 
That doesn't mean our beliefs are reducible to brain states. It means that they are at one level multiform dispositions to behavior, verbal and nonverbal, which are realized physiologically in the brain or I think more likely in networks between the brain and the tongue, the arms. I'm thinking of what you use to speak and what you use to act. And the legs, of course, but there wasn't room for them. And identified by reference to the use of words in the language of the believer and the relation of those words to things in the world. That was my theme yesterday. It took 45 minutes to explain it fully, so I will just leave it at that. You can ask me about it if you want to. Um, as I said elsewhere, it's all physical, but it isn't all physics. That's to say, we shape culture and culture shapes us, and you cannot understand social phenomena in purely physical terms, nor reduce the social sciences to physics, which is not to say that anything non-physical is involved. That's the tricky part. <gasps> can you stand any more? I can barely. <gasps> all right, in philosophy of law, what do I think is going on? Well, first of all, the word law has, I don't know how it is in Polish, but in English it has an interesting ambiguity. It can re it's like truth. Truth can refer to the phenomenon <coughs> being true, or it can refer to a particular truth, yes? Or particular truths. Second declaration of the, Amer second sentence of the American Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, blah, 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 blah. Right? That's the concrete use as opposed to the abstract use. And then again, there's law, the phenomenon, and there are laws, the particular instances of the phenomenon. Um, I believe that legal institutions and roles and rules are a subclass of social institution. And I might say they constitute a pluralistic universe in themselves. I mean, I've already given you a picture of a pluralistic universe at the metaphysical level, but the law is itself a pluralistic universe. Think of, just think of the US, first of all. There's federal law, there's state law. Right? Law is different in every state. Um, the law of Louisiana is more like French law than it is like any other state in the country. And then there's the law of Indian reservations. And then there's military law. This is all just in the one country. And then there's international law and all the other different legal systems of the world. And all that, okay, so pluralistic unit. Uh, I think legal truths are brought, are first of all, local to a jurisdiction and a time, and are brought into being by things human beings do. Um, so, um, including, of course, by the writers of constitutions, there they are doing their thing, um, by legislatures who make laws, by judges who interpret laws. The etc. is meant to cover the attorneys who push and pull at the interpretation of the law and sometimes shift it gradually over the years. And even um, groups like the parents who band together to encourage a state to, so, to pass some law governing where, for example, a sexual predator may live after he leaves prison. Right? These laws are often brought into being by public pressure on the part of parents who are afraid about what kind of people are around their children and around the schools. Um, in Florida, these laws are so severe and the population in Miami is so <coughs> dense, there are so many schools so close together, that there is almost nowhere that someone convicted of some sexual predator offense can live after he's released. Um, so what we have is a colony of sexual predators living under a bridge, which is a horrible illustration of unintended consequences, you know, good, good intentions. And what you have is this appalling concentration of very dangerous people all living together and encouraging each other. Anyway, I, I digress, but <laughs> I feel passionately that this was a very bad idea. Um, I take legal truths to be relative to a jurisdiction and a time, and I take that not to mean 
that truth is relative. I think supposing that that means that truth is relative is to confuse properties of truth with properties of truth. Um, I would say legal norms are conceptually different from moral norms. Um, to say it's really not a good thing to impose on your assistant by asking her to do things like collect your dry cleaning or buy your husband a birthday present. or so. this, is, this is not morally desirable. It's thoughtless and inconsiderate and demeaning. But there's no law against it. <laughs> um, and to say that there's a law against it is clearly to say something different. Um, not sure how I feel about this example, but um, it's certainly morally bad by my lights for a student to buy his term paper or his dissertation from a commercial outfit that sells these things. But there is no law against it. It's not illegal. Um, I, I kind of think maybe it should be, but that's another matter. Um, I think we can assess legal systems and laws as better or worse, um, but there are a lot of dimensions of better and worse. More efficient, more economical, more civilized, fairer. And I don't think there's any guarantee that you get a linear ordering, let alone a unique best. So you might have a system where the laws are extremely fair and civilized, but the thing is so inefficient and so <coughs> slow that nobody ever lives to get justice. They would if they could only live to be 300 years old, but it just takes too long. Um, so, okay. Um, I think I'm thinking of Italy, but <laughs> I believe it has the slowest legal system in Europe. And that when they were censored by the European Union for the slowness of their procedure, they passed a law imposing penalties for proceeding too slowly, which made it slower yet. Okay. Does that make me a legal realist? Oh dear, um, now we have a nasty ambiguity. Um, in legal philosophy, it seems that real contrasts not with idealist, but with idealist. Different understanding of idealism. And at least American legal realism is often cynical. Um, it was described not by, its, um, not by its one of its proponents, but by a critic, as legal realism is the view that what the law is depends on what the judge had for breakfast. Right? That they're just making arbitrary and capricious decisions all over the place. Um, I think I'm sort of half in sympathy with this half in sympathy. Um, I do think that what the law is does depend in part on judges' interpretations of the law. And so if that's part of the story, then yes, I agree. But I think while, yes, sometimes no doubt what a judge decides does depend perhaps not on what he had for breakfast, but whether he had a fight with his wife this morning, right, that might very well have a, you know, he's in a bad mood. But I think what goes on in a lot of controversial and difficult legal decisions is something much more complicated and much more, um, more admirable. That's to say that there are a whole lot of values that a judge might want to um, conserve. And they can't all be conserved at once. So when you get, for example, a plurality decision coming down from the Supreme Court, where you know majority agree that this is the conclusion, but they don't agree on the reasoning. You can actually see them giving different weight to different considerations, um, all of which I usually think deserve some weight, but you can't possibly satisfy them all, and that's how they arrive at different conclusions. So I'm half a realist. I'm not so cynical as the, the breakfast realists, if I can call them that. Um, in short, if I had to say, hmm, what kind of a legal philosopher am I? I'm a neoclassical legal pragmatist. That's to say, I think Holmes had a lot of this right. Uh, there he is, 
in his glorious justice of the Supreme Court. As he got older, the moustache got bigger and bigger and bigger. It's very impressive. This um, postscript. There are scores of questions I haven't answered. Um, I could say, because I don't have time, but that would be an evasion, because I don't know how. Actually, now I do have some idea about real as opposed to fake. I don't have any serious account of where, for example, moral or epistemic norms fit into this picture. I don't have any theory about the status of the entities posited in mathematics. I have, at the moment, just, you know, I don't know. Give me 10 years, I might have an idea. But the, no, I have no idea. Um, well, actually, I do have an idea. Um, there's something Peirce says that looks promising, but I don't know how to defend it. It would, it would fit with my story if it's true, but I don't know how to defend it. Um, I think this confirms something I believe passionately, that the development of a philosophical idea takes <laughs> time. You know, the first thought can be very simple. There is one real world. Spelling it out from there can take years and years, and you constantly need to adapt as you think of phenomena you can't accommodate, like, like me having to admit that there are degrees of reality that there's the brutally real and the real but socially constructed. And what you don't have and you really don't want is a new realism every year or even every decade, which was what my young friend in Bonn was hoping for. Um, I'm afraid I disappointed him slightly because it became clear at the conference that the concern was we needed a new realism because we were now post-postmodern. And interestingly, it was also clear that the push towards a new form of realism was a push primarily towards a new form of moral realism because a lot of people felt that postmodernism had undermined um, political ideals about which they felt strongly. And this was, I thought this was sociologically very interesting. Uh, but I couldn't help him because I had nothing to say about moral realism. Um, and that's how I felt when I was done. 